Okay, let's get started. Um, today we have Software Engineering 1. I know some of you came out of the Software Engineering 2 course that we had last term, so you're taking two. Well, some of you took two before one. I see a lot of new students, so some of you guys haven't taken two yet, which is good. It doesn't really matter which order you take the class in, and I, uh, I just kind of went through this last weekend with the weekend section of this course that started. Um, it's a totally different course. So it's software engineering, but it's more foundational um, how to run a software development project, software methodologies, development methodologies, tools, practices. It's not really best practices like what we did in software engineering 2, which was totally different. So number two, we looked at our risk assessments, costing, the legal aspect of software engineering, a bunch of miscellaneous um, topics that were related to, and they were from a higher level of perspective in terms of what you're doing with software engineering and how to improve the process. In software engineering one, we're just going over the basic processes. So this course is probably going to be a little easier, I think, and it's structured a lot differently. The course is designed to give you some hands-on experience with software engineering, and 55% of your grade is one project that you're working on. And uh, for the guys who showed up, you guys have an advantage because we have a team project in this course. So you guys will be able to form teams today, and uh, hopefully you know, the, you know who's going to show up and who's not going to show up. Classic indication of who shows up on the first day are the people who are normally going to show up throughout the course, <laughs> and the other ones are going to you know, stroll in, stroll out, you know, they're not going to be very reliable for team partners. So today you get the best selection, I would say. Uh, but before I get into that, though, let me talk about what it is you're going to be doing in the course. Uh, what are we doing here? We're focusing on techniques, and this is the syllabus. And um, have any of you not taken any of my classes yet? Raise hand. Oh, bummer. Not even on Monday? No. Bummer. Okay. All right, for those of you who know what I'm going to do next, <laughs> I'll try to make it as small as possible, but I have to go through the fundamental stuff. All right, so for brand, 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 brand new people, uh, my name is Barbara Hecker, and uh, I have a website, and it's uh, bhecker.com, and I wrote the URL down here, and my email address is bhecker at itu.edu. And uh, on the website, you'll see Summer 2011. And in here, you'll see Software Engineering 1. And you'll see it's both the weekend and the weekday section of the same class. It doesn't matter which one you want to go to. In fact, if you want, you could actually switch and go to the class meetings on uh, this one you just missed, though. But the June 18th, 19th weekend, July 16th, 17th. That, actually, that class is going to end in July. Um, which is interesting uh, compared to the regular full session. So we're meeting Wednesdays from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, 11, 12, 12 to 12.30-ish. 12 I start getting hungry. So <laughs> I usually go for an hour and a half to two hours of lecture, and then I hang around. So I'm available for those three or four hours, but I'm only going to be lecturing. You only have to sit here for maybe two hours maximum. Uh, usually about an hour and a half to two hours, and then it hits right there at lunchtime. So you're gonna want—I'm gonna get hungry. So <laughs> we're gonna want to take a break. And then if you are, um, if you are interested, after I have another class, the object-oriented programming of C++ that starts at two o'clock. So naturally, I can't end a class at two and start another one at two. You know exactly. So we're gonna take a break. So we're not gonna go till two o'clock, is what I'm saying. Um, if you click on this little link here, you're gonna go into the uh, software engineering. If you click right here, you'll see the course syllabus. This is what I'm going over today. I'm also going to go over lecture number one. That'll be found in the lecture notes. So if you click on the lectures, you see these are all the PowerPoint lectures for the course. Um, pretty easy. Um, you don't have to log in and you don't have to register for the site. All you have to do is go to it. If you want to post something, you'll have to log in. I had a lot of spam uh, spam and bots coming in through my site last term, and it kind of slowed it down a little bit, so I disabled the posting <laughs> uh, until I figure out how to control it, monitor it a little bit better. Otherwise, you get, you know, Viagra ads and stuff in there. It's just, I, I think it's really disrespectful, but uh, some people, they, you know, on the internet, they don't, they don't care. So, why we're in a good thing. So, I just disabled it, so there's nothing you could post anyway, so there's really no need, to, no reason to register on it anyway, but you can if you want. If you click on the video lectures, you see this is what happened last weekend. 
uh, the video lectures from the 521 meeting. Um, it might be interesting to you. Otherwise, in the video section, I'm going to make one for the weekend, one for the weekday sections, and then you'll see each one of them. So if you miss a class meeting, you can always go in, watch the video, see what you missed. Um, the videos are on YouTube. If you click on the link, it'll take you to the YouTube site. You might find some other stuff there, too. Um, Java stuff, Oracle, stuff from last term. I just started doing this last term, so <clears throat> there's only from spring 2011 on there. Uh, but hopefully in the future, like a year from now, you can go back and say, hey, what about that data mining course, you know? I want to see about that, or the Android development course or something. I want to see what, what, what was that one all about, you know, and you can kind of preview the lectures and stuff if you wanted to without actually taking the class. It's also, I'm hoping it's going to be good for independent study students who are trying to do the class, but they're class isn't really being offered, so they, they're not getting the benefit of any lectures. So, <clears throat> And it kind of archives the, the, the class. Um, up here, this uh, software engineering course is a bit different from some of the other courses I've, uh, I have here. I have this thing called Class Notes. You can download the Class Notes. It's 166 or so pages. And uh, that's going to be, uh, let me bring that up actually. <clears throat> that one is going to be this one here. And uh, it, I'm going to leave it small right now, but it's the official class notes or the, the book, the reading material for the course. There's no book for the course. Um, but this will, uh, it's, uh, it's still loading up. I think it might be 130. <clears throat> you can see it on the bottom. It's kind of, it's not 90, 100 right now. It's 109. Um, what it is is going to be everything you ever wanted to know, plus all of the templates for all of the deliverables for the software engineering project that I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. Uh, so everything for the entire course is in this class notes. And the class notes is obtainable at the same location as the syllabus right underneath it. So. And uh, the way that this works is you can get the assignments from vhacker.com. Um, in another week or so, you can also get them from the EMS. When you create everything, you do the assignments and do it. There aren't any assignments, actually. But we'll go into that in a few minutes. But when you create the project, and um, you upload it into this EMS that I keep calling. And I keep calling it an EMS and one student says, what does EMS stand for? <laughs> I'm like, oh, new students don't know what EMS stands for. Well, you guys do it because you just heard me yet Monday. But education management system, it's a course management system. That's what it is. Uh, Behacker.com is a bulletin board. So I just post up there. You can't respond to anything. You can't, you can't upload assignments. And uh, I wouldn't wait to the very, very last week of class to upload your assignments in the EMS either. And if you don't have access to the EMS and you'd love access to this nice EMS system, then you can contact, and I put it up there on the top there, tech support, T-E-C-H support, at itu.edu. Bug those people. TAs can't, and myself, we, we can't work with you. We can't give you access to it. We can't. Anyway, when you register for courses as a new student, you're supposed to get a, an account. And you're supposed to be able to log in and see your classes in a class list under My Classes. 50% um, of the students might have that right now. I'm not quite sure. Uh, usually there's a backlog. But the summer's not too bad. It's usually the fall term is the biggest term of the year. And so usually the most backlog occurs at that point. So, so let me go back to the syllabus. <coughs> So what we're looking at in terms of the description is we're going through the entire software engineering process from the development point of view. So you don't need any programming skills. We're not actually programming this project. We are creating a prototype, but that's about it. <clears throat> and the prototype, I'll explain, can be paper-based. It can be very low fidelity. You can do it in PowerPoint, actually. Uh, so it's not a technical course. It's more of a business-oriented course. We'll look at the software development life cycles. We'll look at models for software development. And if you've taken the two, we looked at con context models, and you know, there was a higher level. Now you'll get the foundational stuff. <laughs> that will, you know, you, we worked backwards. Uh, we looked at uh, contextual architectural designing and modeling for architectural models and stuff, which was kind of high level if you hadn't had this stuff yet. But now you'll get, you'll fill in with the basics, and maybe that second course will make more sense to you at this point. Um, but the group project gives students hands-on experience developing requirement specification, working through the design document, working through a prototype. And uh, <clears throat> so the objectives, you can kind of read through this a little bit more. Um, under and this, I should change this. It's not really required. If you wanted a book, this is one of them. 
And there's also, there's an engineering approach and there's also one that's called a practitioner's approach. That's the one that I like actually for the second course, the practitioners. For the first one, the engineering approach is actually better. This one is a, it's, it's made by the same author actually. He's got like several different books. Problem with software engineering, especially as a topic for a course. <laughs> It means a lot of things, and there's a lot of different activities, and some books are all on models and on uh, developing system models, and <clears throat> some of them are all UML-based, you know, some of them are all business-based, some of them, anyway, it's hard to find one book, um, and I have this huge, this course notes thing that kind of is better than I would say, because it's more geared towards the course, in fact, it's written for the course, uh, it more geared towards the topics that I'm covering versus a textbook. Uh, but some students find that they need a textbook, especially if they don't have a business, excuse me, if they don't have a software engineering background or a technology background. And so you find the book that's, that would actually be useful to you, whether it be a technology-oriented book or a business book or something. So, um, Or you go on the internet. There's a lot of free stuff. In fact, there's a lot of e-books on the internet, software engineering. It's like one of the, if you typed in software engineering, <laughs> you're going to get everything. I mean, you're going to get thousands or well, millions of hits on that. And it's going to be just way too overwhelming. So what is going to end up happening to you is you're going to feel, well, what's a requirement? What's a requirement? What's a non-functional requirement? Is a type non-functional requirement? <laughs> you see what that is. Um, so you could use the internet a lot for this course as well. Um, grading formula is pretty standard. Uh, don't give out A pluses. The highest grade you can get is an A. Mm. And um, here is the the part everybody's normally the most concerned with is what am I going to be graded in terms of the course. You see there's group work that is 55% of your course grade. Uh, this 55% up here is pretty significant. Uh, and in the course notes, you'll see that, uh, oops, let's try that again. You'll see that template on uh, one of the pages in here, let me see. Here it is. And it'll have the project at 70%. I modified it for this course. It's 55%. So the syllabus is the ruling document. I need to edit that, take that out, but I haven't done it yet. Um, actually, my, I've, I've actually done it. I just haven't uploaded it. <laughs> so I probably should upload it. Uh, but yeah, that, no, that's, that's not accurate at all. So we want to go with what's in the syllabus. The syllabus has it at 55%. So we have the first deliverable, which is the requirement specification. It's the first document you're putting. I'll discuss the themes in a few minutes. But just to go through the grading, this these are deliverables, as I'm calling them. And they're things you're turning in, everything but the peer review, that is. And uh, so we have a requirement specification. We have an analysis document, a design specification. We have a prototype. And then we have a class presentation or demo that's worth 5%. If uh, I will probably make the class presentation or demo extra credit because if we actually have 40 students and they actually show up, which I'm not quite sure they're going to, uh, some of them will, won't do it. So those who actually do it will get five points. So the other people will just leave it alone. And so it's your opportunity to get extra credit if you want to do it, and it's worth 5%. Um, so you'll get it above and beyond, essentially. So there's really 50 points, but it actually counts for 55, and then you'll get 60 points. You'll get the five points extra if you do the, the presentation. And the presentation is like a 10 minute, come up and show me your demo. Kind of thing. And sometimes people find it fun in a small group like this, it might really be fun. So <laughs> if, it, if the class stays small. So um, as we go through the course, I will be discussing the deliverables with you. In fact, we'll be starting with the requirement specification today. Um, I can't really go through every one of these assignments right now because what ends up happening, you have no idea what they are. But to tell you a little bit about the process, um, if you're not familiar with software engineering in general, the software development life cycle model goes through a series of stages from feasibility in the beginning that turns into a feasibility study that turns into a requirements specification. And this is your document, and it's based on your project that you're doing. And then behind the scenes, the team normally does some analysis, and eventually they come up with this, what's called a design document. But I need some way in terms of a classroom environment of assessing your analysis. So I have an analysis document that falls in here. And this analysis document is really just the rough draft of your design document. 
So a lot of the grade, if you've noticed, it's only 5% for the requirements. The requirements is actually probably the most important part of the entire project, <laughs> but it's only 5%. Well, it's usually because teams have a problem getting started to begin with. And then it's very easy to make a mistake with the requirements. Uh, and so I don't put very much weight on it. I put more weight on the analysis and the design and the prototype. Because that's really the most time consuming and the meat of what you're doing in software engineering. So we have this made up document called the analysis document. It's really the rough draft of the design document, but I had to put a different name on it. And I'll tell you exactly what it is you need to know. And we have templates for these deliverables in the software engineering notes. Um, so you'll see, and I'll, actually, I'll show you here, for example, the requirement specification is on page 25 here. Uh, so if I scroll down, it's the first document, it's the first deliverable, so it's, 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 uh, oh, here it is. Ah, passed it, passed it. Back up, back up. <laughs> here it is here. It's kind of small on the screen, but it's starting right here on page 25. And you see, it's, you know, it says on the top, software requirements document, and it's got sections and stuff. And now I'll be going through that in the next couple weeks, actually. We can't, and it's too much to cover for the first day. <laughs> but, uh, well, I'll be going through the template for that. And what you're doing is you're putting this, this is an example, actually. You're putting this document together. And this would be the deliverable. And so each one of these documents are about five, maybe six pages long. Depends on the, the nature of your project that you're doing. Uh, so what ends up happening is in the first couple weeks of the course, we have to kind of pick project teams. And we have to kind of figure out well, what, what project you're going to work on. And so what ends up happening is you have a lot of startup time in terms of exchanging email addresses and Figure, and I'll leave some time today for you to actually kind of maybe talk amongst the people who have shown up and say, hey, are you going to actually go attend this class? Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> then I want to be your partner. And uh, usually I like the teams to be between three and five students. And uh, what ends up happening is, you know, if you get a team past five students, it's really hard to negotiate everything. It's really hard to work together because... One, one person will probably end up doing all the work. And if you get a team of 40 students, yeah, one person's doing all the work. And I don't want one person to do the work and everybody else turns it in. <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. So smaller teams are better you know, for purposes of this course. And um, so the prototype is another uh, one of the deliverables that comes after the analysis and the design. And that one will be a paper-based, or it could be a high fidelity. It could be on the computer if you want. You're not writing the source code. And you're not designing the prototype, you're designing the project. And I'll discuss that in a few minutes. Um, after I get done with the grading and stuff. Um, so you'll be creating this prototype, and your presentation will be presenting it, if you choose to do it. Um, outside of that, there's no grade for a peer evaluation, but I have these two documents that I put out on the website. Oops, not the trash. And uh, they're in the uh, team project files. And what you see are these two documents. One's called a quality control sheet. And the quality control sheet just lists out who did what. And it's a template that you fill out. Actually, maybe I can open this up. Mm -hmm. Here it is. Here it is. Quality control sheet. So you go at team member. There's only room for five people on here as a maximum. So you fill in, you know, Joe Smith. He did uh, the non-functional requirements. Mary did the functional, or, you know, you know, just whatever they worked on in terms of it. And so I know that the team is actually working together, hopefully. And then when you turn stuff in, this is what makes the grading easier in this class. All team members turn in the same thing, but each person turns it into their accounts. So if one person misses it and I see the rest of them and all your names are on all of it, I can find it. <laughs> so that's what makes the grading easy with this class, <laughs> because you're guaranteed to have your name five times throughout the system, you know you worked on something, even though it doesn't show up in your account, it's in somebody else's. <laughs> so. But yeah, I know you do have to put it in for each person individually to see that you're actually involved in it. This actually kind of is twofold. It prevents people from just putting their name on something. Oh yeah, I was on the XYZ program. But they have no idea, they've never heard of you. You know, like making up a team or something. Oh yeah, I was on that team over here. Oh, they forgot to put my name on it. You know, they haven't done anything for the entire course. You're like, all right, whatever, you know. Or those people who are on a team but don't do anything. 
they get a CPT somewhere else, and they get, they come back and they go, oh, yeah, what'd you guys do? Did you finish it? <laughs> but their name, and it, yeah, if I were you, I wouldn't give them a copy of the final report. Otherwise, they're, they're going to take credit for your work, kind of thing, which is not fair either. So this gets turned in, uh, should be turned in with all the deliverables. The way I've got it worked out, and I'll show you the schedule in a few minutes, is that we, uh, I didn't set any due dates on anything. Um, the peer review form, let me just show you this one real quick. Uh, the peer review form, it gets done, ooh, it's kind of small. Let's zoom it in. 200%, there we go. This gets turned in at the very, 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 and it'll be a spot for everybody in the account. It's a peer review. You just fill it out. You're just evaluating the work ethics or the, you know, not the work ethics, but yeah, the work ethics. But, you know, did were they easy? Did they have a good attitude? Were they dependable? Did they, well, how was their work quality? You know, if I don't get one from you, I'll assume everything was perfect. If I get one from you, it says, Joe Smith, who is he? <laughs> <laughs> Never saw him the entire term. Then I know not to give Joe Smith the grade that you guys got. <laughs> yeah. uh, so it helps me evaluate and also kind of assess, and it's a nice little closure to the project to kind of grade your fellow teammates to see, you know, like, and, or sometimes I usually get, oh, everyone worked well on it together. It's like, oh, yeah, that's good. That's a positive that comes out of it. Not to say that, you know, the teams are totally dysfunctional. I will have, at least half of you will have dysfunctional teams. It's just the nature of what happens, so. It happens in the real world that way, too. So. so that was a good percentage of the course. That's 55% that's attributed towards that teamwork. And the project is due at the end of the course. It's broken out into those deliverables, and it's advisable to be uploading into the EMS each one of those deliverables. But I know, so I'm saying, just telling this to the TA right now so he can get the feel for it. The last time I taught this course, I had two different ways of uploading it. I had it individually, each one of these as a requirement for the course. And then I put one at the end that said final project, because some students had problems putting it in. So you can zip it all together, put it in a file, and put it at the last. It'll be in the last week section, and I'll say final project. And then there'll be one for the peer review, and then one for the QAs. Uh, but, you know, it, we'll figure out, and well, I'll have to show it to you when it's, when it's built, I guess, how it gets put together. That, those are the assignments, the, everything. That's all the work for the course, uh, which is different than some of the other courses that I teach here that, you know, sometimes I have assignments, projects, and so like that. Nope, just one project. That's it. And I'll get into more details about the topics and things of like that in a, in a few minutes. But to get through the rest of it here, we have individual work, which is 45%. The individual work, we have a midterm exam, a final exam, and a CSLO essay. For brand new people, CSLO essay means nothing to you. It stands for Course Student Learning Objective Essay. It, you'll have to write an essay for this class. And the way that I'm treating it is I'm just using it as a writing assignment for my classes. So you'll have to put something together. And uh, we do turn it into the uh, turnitin.com, so we archive it, which means you can't recycle it. And it's supposed to come out with a score, and we were supposed to put the scores in the EMS, and that failed completely. <laughs> so um, it's work in progress, and we will try it again <laughs> next term, so we'll see. Uh, but uh, there's a little confusion on the acceptable level, and probably wondering, what is this score, what is this turnitin.com thing? And uh, what it is is essentially checking for my next point down here, which was plagiarism. Oops, there's no plagiarism in here. Maybe I took it out. Um, the essay has to be written by you, and only you can't be cut and pasted. A lot of students have a tendency to write by cutting and pasting content off of the internet and just changing the font and the sentences and making it, you know, word wrapped together. <laughs> Actually, some of them don't even do that. You see, it's written in one font, and it's written in another font, and another font. And then, sometimes I even see URLs and embedded images that are missing and stuff. It's like, nah, that's not good. So you actually have to write. Because this is a graduate level course, so you know, and you're here in the United States learning, practicing your English skills. So it, it's basically a, it's an English assignment. It's a writing assignment. Uh, you don't really have anything else in a course that will be graded that same way. Um, the other thing is the midterm exam will be a take-home midterm exam, and it will happen halfway through the course. Um, and before, um, before the exam is uh, due, there'll be an entry in the EMS, <laughs> so you'll be able to upload the exam. 
And uh, this term, we're going to make a conscious effort to sort start the grading earlier versus waiting until the very last day. So hopefully you'll get a grade on your midterm, and then we can maybe bug, bug sh troubleshoot 50% of the problems maybe in the EMS by the midterm date. <laughs> so, uh, so we don't wait until the very last week to fix all the problems. Uh, not to give this thing a bad name or give you the illusion that it has problems, just beware. It's a work in progress. It's not quite done yet. It's still being worked on. And I hear there's going to be a brand new version of it coming out in the fall. So I'm not quite sure what they're going to do in terms of the, and we have to be flexible, I guess. Uh, so 10% is on the midterm. 10% is on the final exam. The final exam will be an in-class attendance required final exam. You can't get a grade in the course unless you take the final exam. Otherwise, you're going to end up with an I. And then you're going to have to figure out, well, what happened with that? Or well, you might get an I if you can't find your final exam score. <laughs> so you have to figure out what happened with that. And um, that is the only attendance requirement. If you notice in the assignment, if you notice in this grading box here, there's nothing, there's no grade for attendance. In fact, you can meet with your group outside of the class, and you're attending, of course, technically, because you're working on the group project outside. When you turn the project in, I know that you've been working on it. And you can actually listen to my video lectures on uh, behacker.com. You can be flexible. The TAs will be sending you out nasty email messages saying, attendance is required. Attendance is required. Mandatory. Attendance is required over and over again throughout the entire course. Yes, we don't have online courses here at IT. We have traditional style face-to-face -face courses. Some students don't understand that. That's why you get those mandatory requirement things. But I don't grade on attendance. If you miss a class session, it's up to you to see what you missed. That's what makes it a non, it's not an online course. You can't do everything remotely. Obviously, it's going to be hard to pick team members remotely. Uh, well, unless you're really good at spotting email addresses, and, the, and I don't think that there's even a, I don't even think you have access to everybody else's email address who's in this class. Um, so the attendance component is strongly encouraged, and it's desirable to get a good grade. However, if you miss a class, there is no, no one's going to come out with a ruler and slap the back of your hand or anything. Uh, so what you'll have, it'll be up to you, though, to make up what you missed, essentially, and get up to date, find out what's going on in the course, and stuff like that. Um, if you're not on the email list, don't panic. Just, I know, I know he's going to kill me now for pointing him out. <laughs> the TA who's laughing over in the corner going, oh, no. He can get you on the email list, I, I believe. So don't send a message to me asking him to get on the class email list. You probably should have already received something, right? Yeah, so if you haven't gotten any, no, you're shaking here. Well, you are probably not in the EMS yet because you're too new. And I think the email comes out of the EMS, or does it? Have you sent anything out yet? No. Oh, he hasn't sent anything out. Okay. Some of the other ones already sent out the mandatory attendance stuff. <laughs> so, no, you haven't missed anything. Nothing's been sent out for this class yet. So. And then uh, the interesting thing is next week we're going to have a totally different set of people who are going to show up. I mean, registration is still going on. <laughs> <laughs> I know, you just have to work with it. <laughs> all right, grading formula. We are about, uh, grading formula, all group members get the same grade, unless I uh, can see that you don't, uh, someone did not work in the team correctly. So here's what you're all been waiting for, because you're like, 50% of my grade is on this. I have no idea what this is even about. Your team project. So you're doing a team project, which is a software solution. This is software engineering. This is not hardware engineering. <laughs> so, however, you can pick a software development project that has a hardware component. You're not excluded from that. The only requirement that I'm telling you is that it has to have a software component as well. So there has to be some software. How can you get hardware that doesn't have software, though? You can't. Most hardware is driven by software anyway. Um, it would be nice if you picked something that was on a computer, <laughs> but you don't have to. You can pick to develop something that's on an embedded device, um, an air temperature controller unit, a traffic controller unit, a traffic camera that records people who run red lights and sends checks to people in the mail. I mean, not checks, excuse me, okay. bills to people in the mail. I had a friend who got, actually got a bill 
Right, and where I live, there's cameras that, that, you know, if you run the red light, they send you a bill, an invoice in the mail. Well, I want a picture of your license plate. So she actually took a picture of the check. <laughs> and sent the picture of the check to him. I <laughs> sent it in. <laughs> I don't know um, whatever happened with that. So the person's not jailed, so <laughs> I'm sure it didn't go over well. Um, it would be nice probably uh, if they wanted a, a real check. But, you know, nowadays you don't even need the real check. You take a picture of the check and cash it, no problem. Ch chase, you just take and scan it over your phone. You've seen those commercials. <laughs> so. Uh, so that probably wasn't taken as a joke anyway. So, so what are you going to do? You're primarily interested in getting a good grade for the course. So you're going to pick something that, and this is the natural tendency of every student, is going to pick something that's easy. But what your impression of what's easy is different from what's actually easy. The harder, the complicated the problem, the easier it is to actually go through the software development process. Because here, here's the trick. You don't do this unless you've got a complicated software development system that's going to take two or three years. For the project, for the course, you want to think one to two years. You don't want to make something that's too small that can be finished in six months. Now, six months is too short. Anything under a year is too short. You wouldn't follow this development process to begin with. So something that would take to build one to two years from start to finish and something that has more components than just a single application to it. As an example, you don't want to build an Android app. You don't want to build an iPhone app. You don't want to build an application at all, any sort of application. You want to build a system. <laughs> What's a system? It has more than one part, more than one component to it. As an example, university EMS is a system. Um, you could build a new version or you can build an upgrade. So you don't have to pick a brand new system to build. You can say, I want to build an upgrade to the ITU EMS. And actually, if you guys would build that, it would be fantastic. <laughs> but, uh, I think they're doing it right now, though, so they've already beat you to market. <laughs> so. And then what you're going to do for this system is go through the development process that I'm going to talk about when I start my first lecture, where you'll, you'll do your own feasibility study. And your, your, your own feasibility study will be like, you know, okay, can, do we have enough group members? Can we divide the work out? Um, are we all going to be able to communicate? Stuff like that, which is really your feasibility. And then in the real world, you'd be figuring out, do we have enough money? <laughs> do we have enough resources? Is this technology even possible? Can we even do this? You know, I don't care if you can do it or not do it. You can pick a project topic that doesn't work if you want to. You know, I want to build an infrared remote control device that will uh, control devices in other states. You know, it's not going to work. Actually, other rooms isn't going to work. Actually, half way across the room may not even work. So the technology is not is feasibly impossible uh, in the real world. But this is a class. So it doesn't, you can make stuff up if you want it. Um, or work on something that's so cutting edge it may or may not necessarily even exist yet if you want to. Or you can take the other route and go, what about a university registration system? <laughs> Enrollment system. A uh, shopping cart is too small. Uh, way too small. Because uh, you're not building the thing. So the other tendency that students have is to pick something that they can build. You don't have to build it. So you're making a prototype. And the prototype doesn't even have to use a computer. So don't think of it in terms of, I can build a registration, I can build a website, I can build this, I can build that. It's not what you can build that's going to get you a good grade. It's going to be the development process, and it's going to be the deliverables that you're giving me. So sky is the limit, I think big. I would think huge. Um, I'm going to build a new eBay. Man, that'd be cool. Another eBay. Um, so the lesson is like, you know, try to pick topics that already exist, projects that already exist. And some of them think, oh, you know what, we're working on this in my company that I'm working at. We're working on this system. I'm going to pick this system, right? And then they have a vision, but they don't really see the whole system. And then they try to do what's called reverse engineering or backwards. Harder. <laughs> if you have no familiarity with the system, brand new system, easier. So it's the exact opposite of what you'd expect. The less you know about it, the bigger it is, the more complicated it is, the easier it's going to be to come up with your deliverables. Because then all you have to do is follow the methodology and go through and say, well, what are the requirements? How am I going to break the system out? And you break it out. And it's actually more interesting that way, and you learn more. So, so all of the tricks to shortcut. 
And, uh, oh, this one says, oh, no more than five. That's good. Uh, so no fewer than three, no more than five. And forget all the shortcuts because they don't work. Uh, I'm going to assume the role is the end user. And the uh, source of the requirements for each one of the team projects. So you give me the requirements. You, you tell me what you're going to write. I'm not going to pick topics out for students. Uh, so after you pick your team, and we'll leave some time today for that. Uh, well, after you pick your team, you're going to send me an email message. Or actually, we should have it in the EMS. Um, it wasn't the last time. I, if they take the template from the last time I taught the course, I don't know if they're going to do that or not. We'll need a spot right in the beginning for team project selections. So each person will upload in there. Here's my team. Give yourself a team name, like a genius software developers or something. Uh, <laughs> the ITU specialist. <laughs> and, then, uh, and here's my team members, one, two, three, four, five, up to five people. Three to five. Two is not really enough. Three to five works out great. Six is too many. Um, and say this is, you know, this is what we're going to build. That's your first deliverable. There's no grade on that. It just lets me know that you actually got started. So I can go through and say, well, we got four teams. If we only have 40 students in this class, that would be great. That's going to be manageable. Uh, but that will have 10 teams probably. Well, yeah, could be 10. Could be nine teams, nine or 10 teams, maybe. Or more if people go with threes. So uh, I'm thinking we'll probably end up with like 10 or 11 teams probably in this class. Uh, but anyway. Long story short, it'd be manageable, which would be nice. Uh, might make a good break, <laughs> considering huge classes. Uh, so let's see. We've got the peer evaluation form I talked about, the writing guidelines I talked about. I'll get into a lot more details in terms of the expectations of each one of the deliverables as we get closer, because uh, the requirements will have different expectations and have different requirements for the requirements document as the analysis and the design and the prototype in a different way of putting it together. Um, usually these are all just one file though. You'll take, and everything you're doing, you'll just put into a Word file. Um, so you don't need any software. If you have Visio, you're in great shape for diagramming. Uh, halfway, by the time we start getting into analysis, we're gonna start looking at diagramming. You don't actually have to have Visio. Um, there's actually a company, well, it's run through Microsoft called DreamSpark. Um, it gives, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that or not. Um, it has to have a university agreement, and it's something I've been meaning to mention to the administration here um, to get on that list. And they actually can actually download free software from there, um, free working versions. Actually, actually, let me do a little test here, see if they're still around. Before I before I start promoting it, <laughs> what's a Dream Spark? I think it was called. Let's see. I know some of my uh, other students. <sighs> DreamSpark. Yeah, Microsoft DreamSpark. Provides professional level developers and design tools to students and educators around the world at no charge. I know students have been able to get the full version of Visual Studio.net from here, 2010. Um, I actually used it for, uh, I still use it when I teach a, a Visual Basic course at another university. I have them download it from here for free. But uh, you have to actually verify, you have to verify your uh, attendance. If I remember, actually at the break I'm going to do this, I'll send a message and see how, to, to Michael probably, to see how we can get ITU on this. Because they have to verify that you're from the university and that you're a student. Free Microsoft. <laughs> this stuff's expensive. You can get Visio off of here, full version of Visio, everything off of here. Uh, but it's for educational use, obviously. And uh, I don't know if they're going to, I don't know about international stuff. I don't know about how they feel about uh, you know, issues associated with, uh, you know, perhaps the, the nature of the international student body at ITU or something. I don't know. There's, usually there's some sort of fear about, you know, codes getting out and everybody in the world getting free software now. So I don't know if that's going to be something. But that's for Green Spark, Spark to, uh, to address if, if they're interested. And I don't even know, we might actually even have it already. I don't have no idea. I've never tried it for IT. We don't. I'm shaking your head. <laughs> so, um, no promises, but uh, if I remember, I think at my lunch break today, I'll send a message off and see if we can get ITU on here. I know ITU was on the Apple agreement for a while. 
And I think there should still be, so you get student discounts through the Apple Store for being a student at ITU, just like you do at any other university. So. Because we're going for the WASC, I can't imagine. Um, in fact, they're not a cert they don't care about certifications either. So, I don't know. Something, I'm going to leave this up here so I remember. Uh, I go back and I look at it, because I know, uh, I, I'm not mentioning any other schools right now, but, because uh, I don't think it would be professional. Uh, I know at least three other places that I currently teach at that have DreamSpark agreements, and I know because I have all my softwares from there. <laughs> and I have everything I could possibly want for free. <laughs> so <laughs> I wouldn't mind you guys doing that too. So <laughs> I wouldn't mind seeing that happen over here. Uh, all right, academic integrity. Yeah, we know about that, cheating, plagiarism. It's really hard. You know, actually, for this particular course, it's really hard. I smell coffee. I smell something burning. I smell something burning, actually. <laughs> uh, we do have fire alarms. I do see sprinkler systems, which is good. <laughs> All right. We might have to exit soon. <laughs> so, um, I don't really see this as being an issue for this particular course plagiarism. However, uh, I just need to know it is in the, it is in the syllabus, so you can read through it and turn me sure. Um, you're not supposed to cheat, obviously, with that academic integrity. Oh, let's take a look at the bottom here. Course schedule and assignment due dates. And uh, it's a week-by-week -week breakdown, just the same way I've done for all of the other classes that I've taught. The only thing really different about this uh, is uh, not that it doesn't have any due dates. None of my syllabuses have due dates. Uh, but the project is kind of like, you know, it's in this analysis is due, requirements is due, design document is due, and it's kind of like week-by-week. -week. It's a guideline for you to follow in terms of your progress so you don't bunch everything up at the end. The midterm will be around, that's kind of late actually, week nine. I'll probably introduce it two or three more weeks, like maybe six, week five or six or something. And you'll have two or three weeks to do the midterm um, and upload it. Um, but this kind of, which is different from the um, different from the other classes, is instead of going topic by topic, the entire week topic section goes all the way through the system development life cycle. <laughs> so, as we go through the development life cycle, theoretically, when you're doing your projects, you should be completing the deliverables for all of your projects. Um, so we can do, you know, system configuration planning, requirements planning, uh, look at different architectures, different design philosophies and stuff. Um, and then down here, I've got team project, team project, team project presentations. And if you came in late, uh, just to let you know, it's an optional. It's 5% extra credit that you can do. And uh, the presentations will happen, you know, maybe not every week. But when someone comes in, you can tell me, oh, we want to present. During the last part of the course, you'll have an opportunity, you know, so you can come out and present. You know, walk in, oh, look, there's nobody here. Okay, I want to present today. <laughs> <laughs> so you can... Uh, have an opportunity sometime in there. Um, I'm not going to put the pressure on and have like a huge presentation day. Um, I have taught the class before uh, at other places where I've had that, and it causes a lot of anxiety for a lot of students, actually. And it makes, and, and I've also made it a requirement, and then, then that even makes even more anxiety. So it should hopefully be a fun thing towards the end. So especially after you've been working on something for, you know, 10, 11, 12 weeks or so. You might be proud of it, you, know, you might want to show it off, maybe. You know, hey, look at this, you know, and it might actually be fun, interesting. People. Oh, you're doing this demoing the prototype, especially if it's really cool. That'd be fun. So any, uh, oh yeah, and the in-class exam and the peer evaluation are due, and the CS11 is, is due at the very end. So this, in this particular course, it's actually designed for a lot of this stuff at the end. Um, another reason why I do that, actually, is because as you're doing your analysis and as you're doing your design, and we'll see this when I start looking at the software development lifecycle models, especially the waterfall model, which is what we're following in this course, each new phase and stage adds more learning. So you're actually learning more about the system. It's a natural tendency to go back up and change the requirements. <laughs> but if you've already turned in the requirements, well, you know, you're stuck. So in a lot of cases, it's an evolutionary kind of development that's done sequentially. So you're done with the requirements. It doesn't mean and you're supposed to just lock it, feature lock it right there. But I'm giving you the freedom to learn from practice and from experience. 
by the end of the course, after you've finished your prototype, you're probably going to want to go back up and add some stuff to that requirements document to match your prototype, to match your design document, <laughs> to match. And so you can fix things and learn from the experience and use it as a practice way. Um, in the real world, you get stuck and that causes issues uh, because you've left something very critical out of the requirements. You've got to sign off and the customer has approved it and you've asked for $10,000 and now you realize it's going to cost you $20,000 to make the thing <laughs> because you left off this database connectivity with this proprietary system that you need to put in and all, this, the, all these other requirements you didn't think about or spec out to begin with and now you, you're looking at a money pit. You know, it's kind of like when you buy a house and for $10,000 and you need to put $50,000 worth of work in it and the market value of a brand new home is only $20,000 or so. Yeah, those are unrealistic features, but most people in America, they just walk away from it <laughs> at that point. Like, I couldn't sell this if I wanted to, even after I put all the money into it. Uh, it causes the project to fail in a software engineering environment. So, hey, Your project's not going to fail because you're not going to actually finish it. So... That's not really a concern. So you have the freedom to go back and adjust. So you can wait till the very last part of the course to upload it as one project, if you'd like. Or you can do it in stages. Actually, you can wait till the very last day and then put them in in different stages if you want, instead of putting it all in one, on one spot. So it's, it's up to you as in terms of how. And hopefully we'll have, by the next couple weeks, the EMS set up so we have those assignment entries. Questions about the syllabus? About the burning coffee? <laughs> About the fire safety in this building? No, I'm questioning it. <laughs> no. Okay, good. Well, you know, you can read through it. It's uh, it's actually, for our syllabus, it's about five pages long. It's actually kind of lengthy, but uh, it's not bad. And these are the uh, course notes. You're not going to be able to read that. Oh, it's completely downloaded. It's only 113 pages. It's not too bad. So that's not light reading. And uh, just to give you kind of a... Let me go back to the beginning of this. There's a nice little table of contents right here on uh, page three. And it says section one, section two, section three. It could be called module one, module two. It could be called week one, week two. It's basically a sequence, chapter one, chapter two. <laughs> so in the reading in the, uh, the syllabus that I just closed, It'll say on the readings of chapter one, it's referring to section one, section two, section three. Some of it is a bit outdated, I'll warn you about that. Some of it is too much information. Some of it's not enough information. It's kind of a hodgepodge of, of different things. Never really published, needs a lot of editing. It's a very um, rough, rough outline of a course book that never was kind of stopped a little bit halfway through. I ran out of time and energy to finish it. So um, so it's not what I would call publishable quality. However, it's nice reading if you're interested. But you have to take it a grain of salt and skip through the stuff that is too easy for you. So I, I use it actually. You can actually search on, you know, say, I want a requirements doc. And then you can say, oh, then it'll explain certain things that you might be interested in knowing about. Uh, but the lecture notes... And this particular reading is, is really much the course reading in general. In fact, you can't, there's no book on software development life cycles. There's no book that's going to tell you. If there was, actually, I think there are some, there, there's a ripoff they sell in those Get Rich Quick magazines. <laughs> yeah, it's like one of those work at home scams. <laughs> Here, follow the software development life cycle, build software. It doesn't actually work like that, so. It's impossible. It's a scam if you see that. So, any questions so far? Very good. Very good. Oh, we're we're alive. We so I heard some. I heard some no's. <laughs> I heard no. All right. So this is really easy. It'll take about a half hour. Or so, not the most. I'll go to lunch. No, I'll go to lunch. It's about the software process. It's really an introduction to the course. It's 27 slides. Very, very lightweight. And uh, it kind of tells us what we're going to do in the course. So this is complementary to what I just gave you a few minutes ago. It kind of takes on the concepts. It's lecture number one of the PowerPoints, the software process. And I know you guys have seen this before from Software Engineering 2. And I say if I show you the slide enough times, we'll kind of get the, the purpose of this. Good processes lead to good software, and good processes reduce risk. 
which is why we're doing this, actually. We don't have to do any of this. In fact, there's a lot of famous people out there. As an example, the Facebook guy, he didn't do any of this. Did he develop a software system? Oh, yeah. Big one. Big Facebook is huge. It's a system. It's a development project that you can use as a topic for this course if you wanted to. That's, when it, that's a good example. Of it. But he didn't follow any of this stuff because it wasn't done in a traditional software engineering fashion. So some of this stuff you're going to look at and you go, what? Who puts together requirement specification? Yeah, they don't have a requirement. If they, had a, if they had a requirements doc for Facebook, it may have been more successful. And I mean, it, not to say it's not successful right now, but it may have been better. It would have even been better because it wouldn't have taken so long for everyone to get on. They would have made more money faster on it probably, when, they, when they first released it. Right now, they're still putting features on the sucker. They're, they're not even done with it yet. They're, they may never finish it. But they could have had version one and then version two, version kind of like what Microsoft does, you know. And they could have had like a more professional. There's a lot of amateur stuff that went on with it, and it still is going on with that. It's getting better. It's getting more formalized as the company matures and actually becomes a real company. And uh, so that was point number one: that the good processes are supposed to lead to good, good uh, software. The other one is also the concept that good processes reduce risk. And software engineering, as we know from software engineering two, is all about risk management, which is one of the topics that we talked about in number two. But in number one, we're looking at, well, what can go wrong with a software project in general? And number two is what happens when we get the risk in terms of contingency planning and after the fact. And in software engineering one, we look at, okay, how do we reduce the risk? Well, we reduce the risk by following a software development plan and by following through a procedure or a process to develop the software. And that answers that question, you know, how can we reduce the risk? How can the risk be reduced? Well, by knowing what we're doing. <laughs> How do we know what we're doing? Well, we have best practices, and we have best practices that come out of learning out learning outcomes that have come out of the study of software in terms of the process and the development units. And what is this process I keep talking about? Here it is. This is the simplified process. And this is actually a pretty good diagram because it kind of gets through and it covers everything, and then we apply it to a half a dozen made-up models that people come up with. And then it's always the same activities. So if you're thinking about the activities, most projects will have a feasibility and planning stage. Even if it's a couple of guys sitting around at a bar writing on bar napkins, going, I think we should have Facebook. You know, oh, yeah, we need this. Or we, it, that's feasibility study. That's thing. Will people buy it? Will people use it? You know, and it's all guesswork at the beginning anyway, because how are you going to know until it's actually out there? So everyone goes through this kind of stage. In a traditional environment, you might do market research, you know, more formalized business um, survey maybe. You might actually go around and talk to people. You might figure out what it is, what features do you want in the system and stuff like that. You know, it gets you better re results. So the better feasibility, better planning up front, the better. In terms of the development, this is what we normally consider the development process, this box in the middle where we have requirements, design, and implementation. And some of you sitting here going, well, we don't make software anymore in the U.S. <laughs> it's all outsourced. Uh, it doesn't matter. That's one part. It's the implementation right here. It's only one part of the process. It doesn't matter who makes it. In fact, now maybe, I don't know, actually things are coming back. Outsourcing really failed because here's what ended up happening for U.S. companies with outsourcing. It's kind of like, oh, yeah, we're not doing that anymore. Here, you guys build us. We need an accounting program. Here, call up Acme Inc. over there. Have them build an accounting program for you. Okay, and it's like, you know, it's like shopping on the internet on eBay. You can't buy an accounting program for your company on eBay. <laughs> have it built, you know, and then have it sent back. You know, you have requirements. You have to analyze those requirements and design a system that's going to work with your business processes for your company. Well, they were leaving out all of that stuff and just asking for the system. So the interpretation was, yeah, we're going to outsource the implementation, but they never gave, they never did anything else. So most of those projects failed in a lot of cases. A lot of these projects, so some of them are successful. And when they are successful, well, you've got another company 
and there's a ton of money being paid to a consultant who's working with the company and with the outsourced developer and they're negotiating and they're figuring out what the requirements are supposed to be and how the system's supposed to be designed and they're doing all the work and they're getting all the money. <laughs> so, so you want to work in the middle if you're going to do it. But now I mean, it's cost so much, it's going coming back. Now it's like, oh, let's just hire implementers. And now they're going back and they're saying, oh, well, we need to design this thing then. Well, you need to design it then, back then as well. So now you're just going to do it right. Okay, so long story short, you got to do requirements, you got to design, and then you do the implementation. This is really what's referred to as development. This whole thing is software engineering. And then on the end here, we have operations and maintenance. That usually happens after, which is why it's in a separate box next to it. So this is the before and this is the after. Happens after all the development work goes on. That's what we're doing in the class, except we don't have to operate and maintain it because we don't have to implement it. We're taking it all the way up to hiring an outsourced company to do it. <laughs> this is equivalent to building a house in the U.S. You want to build a house, you got to find a piece of land. Uh, hopefully. I mean, we're not in this space age yet where you can build it. You know, I don't know, was it the Jetsons? They had the floating houses. <laughs> yeah. We can't build it on a cloud yet, although you can do your computing on a cloud. You can't build a house on a cloud. <laughs> so you have to find a piece of land, right? And then what's the first thing you do is usually you have a surveyor. You get a bunch of people in there to get the permits, a survey, can we build a house here? That's a feasibility study. So you go out and you say, well, can we build a house here? Well, it's too close to the river, or it's too close to the school, or I don't know. It's not zoned correctly. Once you get the okay, you figure out, oh, I can build here. And then the next thing you do is you come over here, and you start, you start talking to an architect. And you figure out, what do you own? Three bedrooms, two bath, two story or one story? And then how many windows? You know, I don't know. How many driveways? How, many, how big is the garage going to be? And they put together what's called a requirement spec for a house. It's usually an architectural design of the house, the blueprint of what they're building, which is the requirements. So the requirements doc for your software engineering project is the blueprint for what you're building. We're building the first version of the XYZ registration system. It's going to have a module for students to register for classes, drop for classes, pay tuition, you know, all the different functionality. Just the same way as architectural design would say, two bedrooms, one bath, 3,000 square foot, blah, 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 and all the specs. And then we go into a design. In the design, you take the architectural diagram and you come up with a design <laughs> for the house. We're going to use pine wood boards for the, you know, they're not going to use pine anyway. Probably going to use like, I don't know what they build houses with nowadays. For a while, they were change the wood around for termite damages in California. But anyway, depending upon where you live, they might use different wood. Uh, we're going to use this kind of wood. We're going to use copper wiring for this. We're going to use, you know, actually in the, in the old days, it was copper for. You now you turn, if you know how old your building is, if you turn on the water and you get rust coming out, <sighs> galvanized steel, ugh, used to build houses with that, now they use copper. So in your design, you're going to say, I want all copper, or how, you know, maybe in the future it'll be something else, and I want double pane glass, because you know you can build glass single or double, you can use anything you want, or you can have three pair of wire, two pair of wire on your telecom stuff, on your... What about your electrical? Are all the plugs going to be grounded or just ones in the bathroom, you know? That's what you're doing with your software system. So you want a database. Well, what kind of database do you want? It? MySQL, Oracle, <laughs> you know, SQL Server. You know, what database do you want? Yeah, okay, algorithms. What algorithm are you going to use? What encryption method are you going to use? Um, what kind of user interface are you going to have? Um, what kind of connectivity are you going to have? So you're designing everything. After you've done the requirements and the design, if you're building a house, you send it all out and you get quotes from the three or four contractors. Because every one of those contractors should be able to build the same identical house using different crews. And you should come back with the same, and usually you do. Normally you get the same house built. But you're concerned about the price, so you get quotes from three other people. And if you're a software engineering company in the United States, and if you've done it correctly, and you actually have the requirements and the design, which is where the failure came in, you give it to three consulting firms for outsourcing, and you say, give me a quote. 
and then you come back with something that totally does not resemble <laughs> because you didn't give them a design or requirements. You just said, build me an accounting system. That's where our software engineering has problems compared to building a house. The other thing, too, is a lot of companies would say, okay, let's just hire programmers, and sometimes they get three different teams to implement it, and they pick the best one. And now how are you thinking, how in the world could there be a best one when if you're all three groups are building the same identical program from the same identical design spec, it should look all the same? Now, that's the problem you have with software engineering. And that's the biggest complaint where people go, well, is it really an engineering area? Is software, I mean, it's like electrical engineering, mechanical engineering. Is it really an engineering subdiscipline? Discipline? And people argue, well, not really, because the specs aren't quite, and there's no standardization. You're not conforming to anything. You're not abiding by any rules or principles that are, are supposed to be solid that give you these solid results. So that's when people argue, oh, it's not really, it's not really engineering, it's, it's hocus pocus, it's uh, you know, magic or something like that. So, and actually, believe it or not, that's where the art and the science comes together. It does turn into magic, uh, which is why you don't hire a company who's never done this before. So Acme Inc., who's five ITU students who decided they want to join their own business and work in California, and come out and develop software for uh, small startup companies. And this is their first project. Don't hire them. <laughs> if it's their fifth project, maybe. <laughs> if they they have good pricing at that point. First project, you don't know. You don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. Even if they've studied it and they all have PhDs in software engineering, not, don't hire them. <laughs> so here's the waterfall model. This is the model we're going to use for the course. It's actually the uh, same model the Department of Defense uses. It's the oldest model on the market. And why is it still being used? And if it's the old and smart, it's the easiest to understand. And it lends itself very well to that. That is the software process. That's one of the models that's implemented to cover the software process. We have different variations of the model. We have spiral model, iterative development, rapid application development, and all sorts of things. And this is when you, you leave and you go, well, not everybody builds software like this. They don't. Google doesn't build software using a waterfall model. They do that, but they do it in a different order. They use what's called rapid application development. They build the prototype first. <laughs> they start at the end and they work them way, themselves back up to the beginning. And eventually they come up with a requirement spec after the products are ready and the feasibility so after the products are already ready. It's already and users have already been using it. They do the install, the operation and the maintenance right in the beginning and then they go backwards. And they do that because then they're the first to market, and they don't care if it doesn't work. Consumers don't care. How long has Gmail been being worked on? <laughs> New features constantly coming out. Gmail was a prototype, still is a prototype. But you know what they do is like every year or so, every so often they rebuild it from scratch. So they take the rapid approach and then they complement it with traditional development methods that go on in the background. So while they're figuring out what the customers want. They're rebuilding the real system. Because if someone said, we can give you Gmail, and you start this project, and it's gonna, we're going to deliver it in two years, do you think the consumer would wait two years for the use of Gmail in the beginning? Somebody else would put it out there before them. So in order to be first, to be unique, innovative that way, they've got to do a different methodology in terms of their development process. And this is good for government contracts, which is why the government supports it completely and it's widely used. Does government really care if you have to wait two years? Do you know that the only thing we can do on the DMV is register vehicles? <laughs> a couple years ago, they put in the feature so you can get a smog check automatically, electronically. You don't have, in the old days, prior to a couple of years, you had to bring paperwork. You still, in some cases, have to bring paperwork in stand in line. I don't know if you guys, some, some of you maybe have applied for driver's licenses. Huge bureaucracy, huge lines and stuff. You can't do that online. You can't even take the test online. You can't do anything. Because if you do, maybe in a couple years from now, if you put a feature request in, it might be implemented. It might show up a couple years from now. But when it does show up, it'll be solid. It'll be secure. There won't be any problems with it at all. It'll work 100% of the time. It's kind of like like the Social Security is pretty solid. 
a lot of that's automated because they've been spending a lot of time working on Social Security. And the DMV, I guess, is last on the list. <laughs> it takes a long time. And why, meanwhile, if you're doing this in the real world for a customer, they're going to come back and say, well, what have you got done yet? We hired you two years ago. We haven't seen anything from you. Do you have anything to show us? What have you guys been doing? So, you know, regular old market environment won't put up with that. So we have prototypes that we release, which is a modification to this. Where after we get through this particular stage is right around here, we put together a prototype right when the development starts. Because the building of the system is time consuming and we want to show them something. So you put together a fake little prototype thing, and here it is. <laughs> and it models the design and the requirements is what it's doing, which is what you're doing in the project. And you're just not completing it. You're not going through the implementation stage or the operation or the maintenance. You're stopping at the prototype, uh, which is what we're doing. So here, here's the sequential stages that kind of play into this particular model that I just went through, where we have requirements that leads to the software design system and the software design. And we'll be touching upon both of those two concepts in the course, the programming, the unit testing, the implementing, the integration of the system. And these steps here, you'll see it in a... The course notes is listed a lot differently. You'll see feasibility, requirements, analysis, design, implementation, operation, maintenance. <laughs> so these are just generic labels of activities. So what companies do is they, they kind of customize this and then they rearrange the phases a little bit. And what you're looking at in terms of the model is just this, this flow from one, two, three. It's a stepped approach. It's done in a sequence. It's a sequential model from start to beginning. And one of the problems with this waterfall model in general is if you take a look at it, you go, know, ah, it kind of looks like the software project goes downhill right from the beginning. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> Everything is through the toilet by the end. Into the toilet. <laughs> downhill. Down. The crap flows downhill. And it does, actually. But uh, one of the tricks to it is to actually bring it back up and then this slide is then until the very end of this. I have to go to the end. Here we go. we got to bring it back up in order to make it worthwhile. We bring it back up through feedback. So if you're going downhill, and you do a requirements and you stop. And you go and you do your analysis and you stop. And you upload it to the EMS and you upload it to the EMS. And you up, you know, through your, all your sequential stages and you finally hit the end, you're in the toilet by that time. <laughs> in order to pull yourself out, you have to go back up, modify requirements, <laughs> modify analysis, modify design, modify. So you got to bring it back up and go reverse, reverse engineer it all the way back up to fix everything you've gotten wrong. Because otherwise, you're not going to build something that's successful. So you have to build this feedback into the loop. Um, I'm going to save you uh, some and, and give you some reading. This is lecture number one. Read through requirements and now this what what this next is taking one, it's going through one, two, three, four, five. The next five slides is going through each one of these. I'm going to, to assume because you're graduate students that you just haven't crawled out from under a rock. <laughs> you know what requirements definitions to a certain point are? Require what the system's required to do, <laughs> you know, the design of the system. If you're brand new, however, you come from a pharmaceutical health health management background, and this is brand new to you, go ahead, read through the slides on your own, a slower pace. Uh, but we got the system software design, the unit testing, the integration system testing, operations and maintenance. Let me stop here for a second, though. So as I mentioned before, there's some problems. There's some benefits, and then there's some problems with the waterfall model, which is why we have a lot of different variations of this. And I'll show you some variations in a few minutes, and we'll kind of conclude today with that. Um, advantages, it's very visible. When you break everything out into steps, it's kind of like an outline. That's why people outline papers before they write the paper. You can see the introduction, the conclusion, and everything. You can see how everything's going to work. And it's not, uh, there's a dependence on individuals, and you can break the work out. It's, it's kind of like why project managers make project plans with task lists, and then they assign resources. You can easily say, you work on this while you work on that. And you work and can simultaneously get stuff done. You can actually apply quality control and you can also apply cost control because you can work with a project plan. And some of people actually come into this class thinking software engineering is project management. 
Nope. Project management is way over here. Software engineering is way over here. Two different sides of the fence, two different concepts in general. Similar in nature because it's about planning. We're not going to use Microsoft Project in this course, though. And no, we're not going to do any planning. But technically, we would have a planner on staff. And the feasibility and planning stage right in the beginning would be putting together the software plan. And it would be including how long is it going to take for you to do the requirements? How long is it going to take? And then what they're planning for the analysis for the design and what they're planning is the steps in the software engineering process from a very high level overview. They're saying, well, we need five people. It's going to cost us $10,000 to put together the requirements. And we need two people to do the analysis and 10 people to do the design work and then we're going to outsource it. And it's going to come back in 10 weeks. And the project planner is doing all that stuff. They're doing the time and the estimates and stuff. The people in the development team are focused on developing the processes that go into that product, getting that product ready to be built. And um, disadvantages, each stage in the process reveals new understanding of the previous stages that require the earlier stages to be revised. <laughs> That's why I gave you this to show you the feedback that comes back on. So. Let's take away from that concept for a second and consider some other methodologies. And another very popular one these days is evolutionary development. And this is referred to as iterative refinement, and this is what Google does. And it's also sometimes called rapid application development. Um, and they, I'm using them as an example. They're not the only ones that do this. But I'm using them because most people are familiar. They've got more coverage in the media and on smartphones these days than Microsoft. So they are the Microsoft of smartphones. So you guys are familiar because you're using them, regardless of what phone you have. Unless you have an iPhone, and you're, on, you're on the total Apple route. So. The concept, the initial implementation for user comment. Before we wait two years to give you something, let's, get, let's start and give it to you. And then we've got user comment followed by refinement until the system is complete. So GMA Covenant came out and was like, well, here, try it out. And we had a bunch of people trying it out going, hey, it would be nice if we had threading. I learned how to take the threading off recently, though, because I don't like threading. I don't like it at all. Everything Google-oriented is threaded. They have messages that come in groups. You delete one, and the whole thread goes away. You can turn it off. It's in the setup window. And somebody told me about that. And then you could delete them individually. Because so I like to save messages. This is why I don't like threading. It was a slight tangent. I like one comment, one URL, something of the entire thread. But do I really want to go through the entire thread to find it every time I'm looking for that URL? No, I just want to save it. And I get one little message I can save. Yeah, you can't do that with Google if you do turn the threading on. Anyway, it's in the, it's in the email account setup screen. There's a little thing that says, little two little dialogues, thread conversations or don't? Ooh, don't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've been using Gmail for, I don't know, many years. It was just like last week I learned how to do them. And I was giving this lecture, believe it or not, for the weekend software engineering class. One of the students said, here, you could turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> I can. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> But, you know, you go on the internet, and everyone says, you can't turn it off, you can't turn it off. Everyone thinks you can't turn it off. I went on, I looked real quickly, and went, I oh, can't turn it off. It's not obvious, and they certainly don't promote it. So, all right, let me go back to the lecture so we can finish up and go to lunch. Um, we have vaporware. These are other different versions of it, and these are supposed to be bullets. I'm not really quite sure what Greek symbol that is, but they're supposed to be round dots. Um, we have vaporware. It's a user interface mock-up. It doesn't do anything. We have throwaway. These are just different ways of describing, these are different titles of describing what's referred to as iterative refinements. Um, sometimes called vaporware, throwaway prototypes, rapid application prototyping, rapid application development, not on the list, uh, successive refinement, dummy modules, all sorts of different names. It's really all the same concept. I'll remember again. In terms of iterative refinement, here's how it works <coughs> we're doing everything all at once. We are going, and these are different color circles to show you the different color stages. We have the evaluation, we have requirements, design, implementation of the prototype, and it's going around. We're pretty much uh, like a dog chasing its tail, going around in circles. <laughs> and then eventually we're going to stop <laughs> when we catch the tail, but the dog never catches its tail, if you've noticed that. So it just keeps going around and around and around and around, and we never finish. But Google's not finished. Yeah. Is this something similar to the agile system? 
Very similar. Except for Agile is another software development methodology. Uh, just like the waterfall, just like it. It's a, it's a, it's similar to iterative refinement though. So you can pick up an Agile, but learn it like ten minutes maybe. In fact, if you go to my software engineering two course, there's an Agile lecture that will actually kind of gives you a nice little overview. I didn't really actually cover it in software engineering two class, but it's in the optional reading. It's like one of the last couple of lectures that are down, like fifteen or sixteen or something. And uh, it's another software development methodology. That's all it is. People go, they're like, oh my god, it's like, it's like brand new. You know, it's just, you know, it's every fine. <laughs> Nothing really brand new about it. Uh, I mean, you know, it's a, it, it's, it's a, it's a brand new name, <laughs> and it, it promotes flexibility, which is hence the name. But uh, it doesn't really reinvent the wheel. It's something different. Uh, we have the outline of the uh, description. Here's an iterative refinement going back to the software processes. And the thing important to look at here is we've got the concurrent activities. And in here we have the initial version, intermediate versions. And theoretically, you're supposed to come out with a final version eventually. I don't think we're ever going to get a Gmail final version. But we'll see. And um, in terms of this is just essentially getting to the point where these intermediate versions get thrown away. And then eventually we have that final version. So observations about the software process, complete projects should look like the waterfall model, but the development process is always partly evolutionary. Because you, you're not going to get stuck with requirements that don't work. You're going to go back and refine it iteratively as you go through the project. Um, which is why you could turn this whole thing in and at the end of the course and not be stuck with your requirements being graded as is until you finished your prototype and discovered I'm missing half my features in the requirements. So you can go back and you can change it. So. Um, the risk is lowered by prototyping key components, which is what you're doing. And I'll talk a lot more about prototyping as we go through the course. And dividing it out into visible phases, like what, what I've done for you. We have requirements, analysis, design. We have it divided out. And uh, following a visible software product, process and then making use of reusable components. That's uh, actually that's part of the agile process, but it's also object oriented concepts, UML type diagramming, it makes use of reusable reusability as a design feature. We'll talk about reusability, we'll talk about um, processes themselves, phases as we go through the course as well. In terms of the feasibility study for your projects, you have to identify the client, the scope, potential benefits, maybe. What are the risks? How can they be minimized? These are some questions to ask. In terms of what happens in the real world, it's a go or a no-go. So depending upon before you've started the project, it's kind of short and it's very low cost. I don't know why more people don't do this. It's kind of like decision making. Before you go out and buy a car, <laughs> which is a high price point. I mean, okay, to buy something small at a supermarket, you don't really have to spend very much time thinking about it. In fact, most people don't. You just buy whatever's on the checkout counter as you go out through. But if you're going to buy a house or car, you should really be like planning out neighborhoods, planning out features of the car. Do I want a hybrid? Do I want a, you know, are you going to buy a Hummer these days? Probably not. Probably can get one real cheap, but can't afford the gas. So that's what your keys but you think more time would be spent, but people are impatient. They'd rather just go out and buy the car. It's mostly, um, I hate to, hate to stereotype, but it's usually lower class. American people who get anxious. They don't have the patience to do it properly. So they come out of high school and they get jobs immediately without going to school because they don't have, no one's telling them that they have to and they want to make money. And then they forget they're not planning their life at this point. They, they don't do any planning. Actually. It's just a stereotype. But you see it more when you start comparing how people grow up here versus in other areas of the world. Now there is where all the parents are teaching them, you know, go to college, get a degree, <laughs> get a job, get married, this is what you're supposed to do. On this side of the fence, it's free for all. <laughs> There's no, I mean, little Japanese kids, they're speaking English by, I mean, they're speaking English and French and Japanese by the age of five. Over here, we're barely speaking eubonics. <laughs> Shouldn't say that. We're barely speaking. That's, you guys probably have never heard that. You know, it's a racial thing. 
around here having to do with African Americans, actually. They were trying to make, okay, I'll, now that I brought it up, I'll finish real quickly. Uh, American slang, which is why a lot of foreigners have a hard time learning English, because there's a lot of slang, actually, and then there's a lot of pe words that come from different languages that end up in the English language that are not from English, or they're not from England, they're not regular English. So, long story short, there was this group of people in Oakland, East Bay, um, primarily African American culture, who came up with this language called Ubonics. And it was slang, all right, some people think it's slang, some people think it's a real language, it's a dialect is what it is. It's a different dialect of English that comes from certain cultural, and I don't know even, that's why I hesitate even mentioning this, I'm not even, I'm not even familiar with what dialect this is or where it actually comes from. All I know it's, it's associated because of the way it was presented in the media, one would get the impression that it was associated with African American culture. And um, words like, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like a, no, no, actually that's not Ubonics, that's Hick. That's uh, Southern Middle America. You know, they, they, put, they put all the words together. That's, did you eat? <laughs> or, y'all, that's you all. <laughs> Very similar to that, Ubonics was something that is, is still widely spoken, actually, with the kids. And they wanted to make it a language like a real language, and there was a lot of controversy, there was a lot of stuff, it finally just died out. I don't know if it ever became a, an acceptable language, but they were trying to teach eubonics, as a, uh, and then there was English as a second language for eubonic speaking children, because you'd grow up in the environment, and then you'd have to change your dialect, change your speaking. But unlike other countries, it was not an official dialect. You know, like people that from different regions of different countries, they have different accents, they have different word vocabularies. We don't have anything, it, it, long story short, we don't have anything of that here. <laughs> Therefore, no feasibility. <laughs> no feasibility study. No planning. No, we're going to develop this new language, we're going to call it eubonics, and we're going we're to market it this way, and we're going to get everybody to speak it. If they did that differently, they actually ran a feasibility study, and maybe it would have passed. I don't know. But uh, that, the long story short point I was trying to make was, uh, for some strange reason, this culture doesn't lend itself well for pre-planning. <laughs> and I don't know if it's a cultural thing or just a Calif it's not just California either it's the entire United States <laughs> but just look at our California state crisis budget did we really plan for anything? <laughs> no <laughs> why would we be in a deficit right now? it's kind of like people when they manage their own checkbook there's a reason why your checking account has a negative balance <laughs> you spent money you didn't have <laughs> alright now that I've totally gotten off on another tangent, and I'm going to have everybody from all racial backgrounds <laughs> throwing rocks at my car as I leave today, but I don't think we have any African American people, although they might be listening to this on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm going to have all these nasty comments about how I'm prejudiced or something. I'm not trying to be. I'm trying to be neutral about it. And I don't actually hold any prejudice about anything, but I find it ridiculous sometimes when certain groups push an initiative without planning ahead. Well, what are we going to do when this is a formal language? <laughs> and why should it be? You know, I mean, just think about the concept of the language and how it's developed. Anyway, get off that. Uh, class projects, what are you going to create and why? And your client is me and your client are the students. Can you certify both? Of course you can. Anything you pick will be acceptable. You don't actually have to get your topics approved, but I'd like to kind of just keep a status update on who's already been, who's selected a project and who's working together just to see that you guys are actually starting the process. The scope itself, what boundaries, what team members, I don't know if you have 15 weeks, I think it's more like 11 to 13 for this particular summer term, but I'm not quite sure about how many weeks we have yet. You need a prototype that's going to demonstrate the main features, but it doesn't have to do everything. But don't pick the project because you think you can make a prototype. Think it because you like the topic or something. And you may also think of it this way in terms of potential benefits, and here's some starting points to help you get started thinking about topics, and there's no due date on the topic either. Um, you might want to create a marketable product, maybe, like you know, a better version of Facebook or something, maybe. Um, you might want to improve the efficiency of an organization, maybe. Make something, you know, you're working at a company and you can make something better by automating something. Um, controlling a system that is too complex to control manually, an inventory system sales reporting system, maybe a new or improved service, safety, security, something. 
Um, or maybe get a good grade in class. <laughs> maybe that's your objective. That's what you're thinking about. So resources, three to five people. And think about, uh, in fact, if you're going to form a group today, I'd get everybody's email address, uh, just in case you don't see them again. <laughs> Hopefully you're not going to pick people you're not going to be able to work with either. That's why you guys pick your own. If you don't want to work in a group, you don't have to. You can be an imaginary group of one. <laughs> it's really not a group, unless you have multiple personalities. And I won't even touch that topic. <laughs> but, <laughs> you can, because some people might actually, especially if you're uh, listening to this video on YouTube and you're not sitting here right now and you're thinking about how am I going to form a group of three to five people when I don't even know who's in the class, then you're probably going to be working by yourself because you're probably not going to want to work with people you don't know or people you haven't met and people you can't meet because you're not here. So come here next time. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, so long story short, you can be in a group of one. Even if you do come here and you want to attend a class in person and you're a really excellent attendance, you can still be a group of one. There's no prejudice. You get the same grade, same work, but it's a lot more work for you. Less communication work, less group work, and hassles, but more individual work because you're, you're responsible for the entire project. There's no less, lesser workload. You still have the same deliverables, same product, same concepts, but you're just working alone instead of in a group. Uh, what do we got? The time, equipment, you, uh, no special needs or anything like that in terms of what you're building, obstacles. You don't have to worry about half of these obstacles, but in the real world, these are some of the feasibility things that you'd be looking at in terms of the beginning of the project, which is going to be more along the lines of startup time, resources, funds, changing circumstances. And what you're looking at is how to minimize risks. In fact, that's what you're actually doing. When you, even informally, without even thinking about it, when you select your team members, when you select your topics, you're minimizing your risks usually. You're not going to go out and pick the worst people you could possibly think of that aren't even here yet and say, are you going to give me my team member? <laughs> you're going to make things easy for yourself. And good processes lead to good software. And good processes reduce risk. There's a repeat of that stuff in red right there from the beginning. So the project topic statement is your first deliverable. There's no grade associated with this. So each group is going to pick a name, hand in a sheet, well, actually, if you want to hand in a sheet, you could do that. You don't have to post it to the EMS, considering that there's no grade associated with it. You could just put it on a piece of paper if you want to. Give me a piece of paper. That way I can kind of keep track of how many teams. What I want to do is, it's not really a numbers crunching thing. It's more along the lines of, are we making progress yet? <laughs> or are we stuck? Or do I need to help you guys or something? You know, It helps me kind of monitor what's going on. Each group needs to pick a project topic. It's just a paragraph or so. Sure enough, everybody reads it. You know, kind of a short description. I'm the only one who's going to read it. Uh, long enough uh, so that hopefully no important details are missing from it. So just give me, in fact, if you have a, if you're going to do it on a piece of paper or in a Microsoft Word document to put in the EMS, it doesn't really matter either way. It well, actually just put your names, your email addresses on there, your topic, and maybe a paragraph. It says, we're going to build a registration system. It's going to have X, Y, Z components. And it's going to work like this. You don't have to pick your teams today. You can wait till next week if you want as well. And there might be more students. There might be different students here next week because uh, registration is still going on. So. There's no hurry, but I would say uh, you know within the first couple weeks, first three weeks perhaps, not a bad idea to actually start planning who's going to be on your team and what you're going to do because you don't want to wait till like the end of the term and go, oh, I need a team. Because if you're a good team, you're not going to let that new person get on your team. Otherwise, we're just getting credit for all your work. So, so this is about the time we'll end um, normally, I guess. I was going to let you, well, I met you, let you out about 15 minutes earlier. So, so. Questions? What's eubonics? No. <laughs> Comments? Concerns? Get your concerns out now. Don't throw rocks at my car. <laughs> yeah? Okay, good. None of you are African Americans, so you're not going to have a beef with that. <laughs> and I really didn't even, it actually didn't even say anything about African Americans. I said ebonics as a language. That's my problem. Not problem. That's my concern. I don't think it should be a language, but 
If you go on the internet, you just look it up. I think it starts with an E U V something. You'll see a bunch of people, all their comments about how they think it's a crock of something. So. All right, we're done for today. No more, uh, no more comments about eubonics or anything like that.